I think that they are religious fanatics. They happen to believe in the state religion, which is much more dangerous than uh, other religions for the most part. So they, uh, both of them, happen to be defenders of the state religion, uh, namely the religion that says uh, we have to support the uh, violence and atrocities of our own state uh, because it's being done for all sorts of wonderful reasons, uh, which is exactly what everyone says in every state. And I, I don't regard, that's just another religion, like the religion that markets know best. I mean, it doesn't happen to be a religion that you pray to every uh, once a week, but it's just another religion and it's very destructive. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We return to MIT professor Noam Chomsky. Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I spoke to him on Tuesday. I uh, wanted to ask you about Latin America. We had a period for about 10 years of uh, uh, enormous social progress in Latin America, all these uh, socially minded governments, reduction of income inequality, the only part of the world where there are no nuclear weapons. Uh, and yet now we've seen uh, in the last few years a real steps backwards. Quite a few of the popular governments, with the exception of Ecuador recently, uh, have been thrown out of office and uh, a deepening crisis in Venezuela. Your sense of what had happened and that, that after so much promise, all of a sudden it seems that the region is going backward? Well, there were, there were real achievements. Uh, but uh, the uh, left government failed to use the opportunity available to them to try to create sustainable, viable economies. Uh, almost every one, Venezuela, Brazil, others, uh, Argentina, relied on the rise in commodity prices, which is a temporary phenomenon. Uh, commodity prices did rise, mainly because of the growth of China. Uh, so there's a rise in the oil price of soy and so on and so forth. And instead of trying to develop a sustainable eco economy with manufacturing, uh, uh, agriculture and so on, like Venezuela is potentially a rich agricultural country, but they didn't develop it, they simply relied on the, uh, uh, the commodities, raw materials, commodities they could export. Uh, that's a, a very harmful, it's not only not a successful, it's a harmful development model. Because when you export uh, grain to China, let's say, they export manufacturing goods to you, and that undermines your manufacturing industries. And that's pretty much what's been happening. On top of that, there was just enormous corruption. Uh, it's just uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, painful to see the Workers' Party in Brazil, uh, which did carry out significant measures. Uh, just They just couldn't keep their hands out of the till. Uh, they joined the extremely corrupt elite, which is robbing all the time, and took part in it as well, and discredited themselves. And there's a reaction. Uh, I don't think the game is over by any means. There were real successes achieved, and uh, I think a lot of those will be sustained. But there is a regression they'll have to pick up again with, uh, one hopes, more uh, uh, honest uh, forces that won't be, that will, first of all, uh, recognize the need to develop the economy in a way which has a solid foundation, not just based on raw material exports, and secondly, uh, uh, honest enough to carry out uh, decent programs without uh, robbing the public at the same time. What about Venezuela? Venezuela is really a disastrous situation. The, uh, the economy relies on oil uh, as to the, the great, probably a greater extent than ever in the past, certainly very high, and the uh, corruption, the, uh, the robbery and so on has been extreme, under the, especially after Chavez's death. So it's, it's a, I mean, if you look at it, it still has, uh, if you look at, say, the UN uh, Human Development Index, uh, Venezuela still ranks, uh, say, above Brazil. So it's, uh, the, uh, uh, there are hopes and possibilities for uh, reconstruction and development, but the promise of the earlier years has been significantly lost. Now, what the statement is that, you know, in the course of time, uh, Israel should no longer exist. Well, actually, I happen to agree with that, too. In fact, so do a lot of people in Israel, the ones who think there should be a single democratic state. That's not calling for wiping anyone out. Actually, there is, there are two countries that are not only calling for some nation not to exist, but are destroying it, namely the U.S. and Israel. That's their position with regard to the Palestinians. And they're not just saying it. I stress, they're not just saying it, they're doing it day by day. That's the meaning of the policies that are going on right before our eyes in Gaza and the West Bank, which we are supporting and paying for. Now, as far as socialism is concerned, that term has been so uh, evacuated of content over the last century that it's hard even to use. I mean, the Soviet Union, for example, was called a socialist society, and it was called that by the two major propaganda um, uh, 
operations in the world, uh, the U.S., the Western one, and the Soviet one. They both called it socialism for opposite reasons. Uh, the West called it socialism in order to defame socialism by associating it with this uh, miserable tyranny. The Soviet Union called it socialism in order to gain whatever, to, to benefit from the moral appeal that true socialism had among uh, large parts of the general world population. But this was about as remote from socialism as you can imagine. I mean, the core notion of at least traditional socialism, is that uh, what you mentioned, that working people have to be in control of production and communities have to be in control of their own lives and so on. Uh, it's, uh, and, you know, this is, this goes, uh, the Soviet Union was the exact opposite of that. Uh, working people had no control over anything. They were uh, virtual slaves. Uh, and the collapse of the Soviet Union is, in fact, a small victory for socialism, in my opinion. It eliminated one of the major barriers to it and should have been recognized as such. But the term has been, uh, as I said, so become so meaningless that it's hard even to use. If we use it in the traditional sense, which you brought up, uh, that goes, that, you know, that goes straight back in American history. You read the working class press in uh, the mid 19th century, you know, press uh, published by uh, um, artisans and what were called factory girls, young women from the farms working in the textile mills in uh, eastern Massachusetts, which was the center of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, their press was calling for, uh, um, they said the, their theme was that those who, uh, uh, those who work in the mills ought to own them. Uh, but one of the main tasks of the U.S. forces, as they did what was called liberating Europe, was to essentially restore the fascist order and, and, and undermine the resistance. Actually, that was a worldwide project. If there was such a thing as a history of the post-war world, uh, you'll wait a long time for that, it's post-Second World War, its first chapter would be uh, on the global effort to destroy the anti-fascist resistance and to restore the fascist structures. Not necessarily with every single leader, like you didn't want Himmler back in there. You know, but you wanted the, the important people. I mean, all the people who funded him and organized it and ran it and so on. Uh, the, they're called the moderates, you know, the ones who kind of try to benefit from the system and participate in it, but don't actually push somebody into a gas chamber. They're the moderates. Same thing in Haiti, incidentally. It's, it's on a much smaller scale. So you had to get back the moderates, the fascist system, and you had to destroy the resistance. The reason is the resistance had all kind of crazy ideas. Uh, they were interested in things that were called radical democracy. Like, for example, when the Americans started in Italy, when the America, which has been the target of more CIA operations since then than the rest of the world combined, probably, uh, but certainly most. Uh, the, in Italy, uh, the liber the, there was a real resistance that had held down six German divisions and it had liberated most of northern Italy before the liberators got there. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they had set up uh, popular committees and they'd taken over factories and uh, they were rebuilding the economy and they were doing what was, they were doing some really bad things. Uh, the British, this was the British Labor Party, incidentally, the British Labor Party and us, the, the Roosevelt Democrats, were appalled by what they found particularly because they were doing things like hiring excess workers and carrying out arbitrary dismissal of bosses, most of them fascists. So they were arbitrarily dismissing fascists and hiring excess workers. Uh, meaning, and I don't have to translate what that means, but anyway, that's not allowed. So the U.S. went in, disbanded the resistance, stuck the old bosses back in power, stopped the hiring of excess workers. And suddenly these same reports, which are now all declassified, say, yeah, hunger is the worst problem in Italy, but hunger is their problem not our problem. Our problem is to make sure that the old fascist order gets restored and they can take care of the hunger. Uh, so it starts off from there and it was the same all over the world. It, so the, the, sometimes very brutal, like in, South, in Korea, for example, the American occupation in South Korea killed about 100,000 people before what we call the Korean War. You know, we call the Korean War 1950, but it started in 1945 and then it was mostly killing the anti-fascist resistance and restoring the collaborators and even using the Japanese police. Incidentally. And the same thing, it's true worldwide, there's not an exception to it as far as I know. Uh, well, one aspect of this was saving the people you couldn't keep there. So I take, say, Klaus Barbie, famous, uh, when, he, you know, the Witcher of Lyon, big Nazi killer. Uh, when the American forces moved in, the first thing they did was simply restore him to his old job. Uh, and in fact, when he was later, you know, a couple of years ago, he was picked up and there was a big scandal about it. Uh, his commanding officer in U.S. intelligence actually had an interesting letter in the Times. He didn't identify himself, but I checked out, it out and he was his commanding officer in intelligence. He said, look, it's crazy to criticize U.S. forces for this. Klaus Barbie was a specialist in uh, going after the resistance. And that's what we needed, because we were going after the same people. So why shouldn't we go after the guy? Like, we were taking over where the Nazis left off, so why shouldn't we use the people who know how to do it? This is stupid. You know? Well, okay, Klaus Barbie was restored to his job, uh, but there came a point when they just couldn't keep him on. You know, it was too, too much of a killer. So he was spirited out of Europe through a network. It was called the Rat Line, which involved the Vatican and all sorts of Nazi priests in Croatia and so on. And they got him off to Latin America. He ended up in Bolivia, where indeed he was involved in narco-trafficking and military coups as late as 1980, and that the US was involved in and so on. So there's a direct connection. Actually, the most extreme case was Reinhard Galen, who was the head of, under the Nazis, was the head of, uh, uh, in, of Eastern European operations, meaning, and you know what that means. That's the huge massacres I mean, of everybody, Jews, Slavs, everyone. That was his job. And he was picked up right off very fast uh, and reestablished as the central part of US intelligence uh, dealing with Eastern Europe. 
And uh, again, for obvious reasons, he sort of knew the ropes, you know, knew the job, knew who would go after and so on. Uh, and in fact, part, this is all run out of George Kennan's office in the State Department. Uh, he, uh, uh, this is all well known, it's, you know, there's good books about it, a lot of documentation and stuff. He, uh, they're very straight books, I mean, this is not marginal, you know, mainstream books now talk about these things. Uh, and uh, one of his jobs, for example, was to support armies that Hitler had left, had established in, you know, the Ukraine and places like that. And we were supposed to be, he was supposed to be supporting them and organizing them, and in fact there were airdrops and CIA actions and so on up till the early 50s. The only reason they stopped is because it turned out that the Russians had everything penetrated uh, and everything was being exposed, and every time they had an airdrop, they just picked up more guys involved with the CIA and so on, so they finally called it off. Supposedly, nobody knows, but supposedly it stopped in the early 50s. Uh, the, the other, another aspect of this was simply bringing Nazi war criminals to the United States. Uh, a lot of them were scientists, and that part is known, but less known is a more interesting aspect. They brought counterinsurgency specialists, guys from the Wehrmacht and the SS, who were engaged in anti-partisan activities, and they were brought over and involved with the U.S. Army, who was then trying to work out counterinsurgency doctrines, what later became counterinsurgency and low-intensity conflict. Now, if you look at the history of this, it begins with U.S. Army studies, they're now declassified, uh, uh, based involving Wehrmacht and SS officers, studying how the Nazis tried to put down the partisan resistance in Europe and where it succeeded and where it failed and what lessons you can gain from it and so on. And it's written, they're all written from the point of view of the Nazis. So the partisans are the terrorists, you know, and the Nazis are defending order and so on. You know, all the stuff you read about and everything you read about Central America, and they designed the techniques, and they became counterinsurgency literature. Actually, if you want to have a look at this, there's a quite a good book about it by a guy named Michael McClintock, who was a researcher for Amnesty International for years, and then took off, and he wrote a book called, uh, he's written several books, but this one's called Instruments of Statecraft. It was published by Pantheon a couple of years ago, and he has a lot of details about this stuff. I I've reviewed it in some stuff I've written through, but uh, he has more, a lot more details. So there are these various strains. They all make complete sense. Uh, it's, uh, I should say there isn't much of a gap. And if you do an honest history, the gap is a few years. Uh, the U.S. was very pro-Mussolini. He was that admirable Italian gentleman, as President Roosevelt called him. Uh, they kept supporting him into the late 30s. The U.S. was pro-Hitler. The British were even more pro-Hitler, I should say. This goes on into the late 30s in the United States. The late 30s, the European branch of the State Department is sending back reports saying, we have to support Hitler and other fascists because they're the only barrier to uh, popular forces taking over towards the, against the labor movement and so on, uh, which might you know, take over unless somebody there's a barrier to this atrocity, and that's just the fascist. That Hitler was a moderate, you know, standing between the extremists of right and left, just like Duarte and El Salvador. I mean, this stuff is just, you know, goes on. as far as the British were concerned. I mean, even it's amazing, but even after the Battle of Britain, you know, like when the Nazis were bombing London, they were still kind of supporting the Nazis. Their objection, you know, they didn't actually support them, but their objection to the Hitler-Stalin pact was that it gave Stalin too much power. That's as late as 1941 in British Foreign Service Office records, which are now out. Uh, so Hitler was like a secondary problem, even when he was bombing London. And the reason is, look, it's basically a class war, you know. Uh, and they understood this. And they were on the side of the class that happened to be supporting the Nazis and, they and the fascists, and they restored them. Uh, they started restoring them very soon. First place that was liberated was actually North Africa. Uh, and there, uh, Roosevelt put in, uh, this in late 1942, he put in Admiral Darlong, who was one of the leading Vichy fascists. In fact, the author of uh, Vichy's anti-Semitic laws. He was put in charge. Then when they started liberating southern Italy, same story. I mean, first of all, they reinstated the mafia for control, but also they just began reconstituting the traditional conservative order, which meant mostly fascist sympathizers. Who else? It's exactly, look, it's just a foretaste of what you're going to see the next couple of months in Haiti. You know, you want to predict what's going to happen, just take a look at history. It happens all the time. When the Soviet Union collapsed, I actually wrote an article uh, saying this is a victory for socialism, small victory for socialism. I just couldn't get it published. Nobody knew what I was talking about. The world's two major propaganda systems, the West and uh, the Soviet Union, they both decided, made, determined to use the word socialism to refer to the totalitarian system of the Soviet Union. I mean, the West did it to discredit socialism, the Bolsheviks did it to try to gain you know, the credit associated with genuine socialism. Well, when the world's two propaganda systems agree, it's going to be very hard for people to extricate themselves from it. So now, the socialism has, the term has been degraded to mean the form of totalitarianism uh, instituted by Lenin, uh, carried through by Stalin. And I was going back to Spain, it was entirely natural that they should be in the lead in destroying the popular revolution. De Kooning, much earlier, had predicted all of this. He said that in the future, it will be two forms. Uh, one form will be they'll take over the state and they'll create a red bureaucracy, which will be the most um, vile and brutal regime the world's ever seen. And there are others who will understand that they can't take over the state, so they have to serve concentrated private power and state power. And they'll be the technical intelligentsia who, you know, uh, implement the policies of the masters in uh, what we now call um, liberal democracies, which is a very good prediction. It's one of the few predictions in the social sciences that actually came true, which is one of the reasons why nobody ever studies it. It's much too dangerous to insight. You said that if the Nuremberg principles were applied, every post-World War II president would be uh, indictable. That's probably true. Can we run uh, run down them real fast? What did Eisenhower do that you would indict him for? Eisenhower, uh, 
overthrew the conservative nationalist government of Iran with a military coup. Uh, he overthrew the first and last democratic government in Guatemala by a military coup and invasion, leading to years of it. Uh, in Iran, it led to 25 years of brutal dictatorship, uh, finally overthrown in 79. In Guatemala, it led to massive atrocities, which are still continuing. That's after almost 50 years. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, this wasn't known until recently, but he conducted the uh, major clandestine terror operation of the post-war period up until Cuba and Nicaragua in an effort to break up uh, Indonesia, strip off the outer islands uh, where most of the resources are, uh, and uh, undermine the what was then considered as a threat of Indonesian democracy. Uh, Indonesia was too free and open. It was allowing a uh, political party of the poor to participate, and they were gaining a lot of ground. So that uh, uh, Eisenhower supported and helped instigate a military rebellion in the outer islands. Uh, this is just for starters. Now, these are all indictable offenses. What about Kennedy? Kennedy was one of the worst. Uh, Kennedy, first of all, invaded South Vietnam. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, uh, they had blocked a political settlement in 1954 and instituted a kind of a Latin American style terror state, which had killed maybe 60 or 70,000 people by the end of the Eisenhower uh, period and had instigated uh, uh, a response, a reaction. Uh, Kennedy recognized that it couldn't be controlled internally, so he simply invaded. Uh, in 1962, uh, about uh, a third of the bombing missions that were carried out by the U.S. Air Force in uh, uh, South U.S. planes with South Vietnamese insignia, the U.S. pilot, uh, they author he authorized napalm. Uh, he began the uh, use of uh, chemical weapons to uh, destroy food crops. Uh, uh, they began programs which uh, drove millions of people into what amounted to concentration camps. Now, that's aggression. Uh, in the case of Cuba, it was just a massive campaign of international terrorism which almost led to the destruction of the world, led to the missile crisis. Uh, and we can continue. Again, these are all uh, indictable offenses. Well, Johnson. Well, Johnson expanded the war in Indochina to the point where he ended up probably leaving three or four million people dead. Uh, he uh, invaded the Dominican Republic to block uh, what looked like a potential democratic revolution there, uh, supported uh, the Israeli uh, occupation in its early stages. Uh, again, we can go around the world. Uh, take, your, take, take, say, Carter. No, I'll, I'll get there, but Nixon's next. Uh, Nixon, we don't even have to talk about. <laughs> we, can, we can skip that one, okay? But, uh, yeah, Ford, then Ford. Well, Ford was only there for a short Couple time, years. but long enough to uh, endorse the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, uh, which became about as close to genocide as anything in the modern period. Uh, they pretended to uh, oppose it, but secretly supported, in fact, not so secretly. Uh, the, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, immediately after the invasion, the U.S. did join the rest of the world and formally condemning it at the Security Council. But uh, Ambassador Moynihan uh, was kind enough to explain to us in his words uh, that uh, his instructions were to render the United Nations utterly ineffective in any actions it might take to counter the Indonesian in great, uh, invasion. And he says proudly that he did this with considerable success. Uh, his next sentence says, uh, in the next few months, it seems that about 60,000 people were killed. And then he goes off to the next topic. Uh, that's the first few months went on to probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, uh, formally, the U.S. Uh, announced a boycott of weapons, but secretly it increased the supply of weapons, including counterinsurgency equipment, so that the Indonesians could consummate the invasion. Uh, that's uh, just a short period in office, but that's indictable. Seriously, in fact, that's a major war crime. Carter? Carter uh, increased as the Indonesian atrocities were increasing. They peaked in 1978. Uh, Carter's flow of weapons to Indonesia increased uh, when Congress imposed the human rights restrictions. By then, there was a human rights movement in Congress uh, to block the flow of uh, uh, advanced weaponry to Indonesia. Uh, Carter uh, arranged through Mondale, vice president, uh, to get Israel to send U.S. Skyhawks to Indonesia uh, to enable Indonesia to complete what turned out to be near genocide, killing maybe a quarter of the population or something. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, Carter just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, his great achievement was the Camp David Agreements. Uh, the Camp David agreements are presented as a, a diplomatic triumph for the United States. In fact, they were a diplomatic catastrophe. Uh, at Camp David, uh, the United States and Israel accepted, finally, Egypt's 1971 offer, which they had then, the U.S. had rejected at the time, uh, except that now it was worse from the U.S.-Israeli point of view because it included the Palestinians. Uh, in order to accept, get Israel to accept Egypt's 1971 offer, after a major war and atrocities and so on, uh, Carter raised uh, aid, military and other aid to Israel to more than 50% of total aid worldwide. Israel used it at once in exactly the way they said they were going to do, as every sane person knew, uh, as an opportunity to attack their northern neighbor, first in 1978 and in 1982, and to increase uh, integration of the occupied territories. 
Uh, and that's for starters. We can continue. Reagan? I don't think we have to talk about that one either. I mean, Reagan is the first president to have been uh, uh, condemned by the International Court of Justice for what they call the unlawful use of force, meaning international terrorism in the war against Nicaragua. Again, that's just for starters. Uh, they also, the Security Council, uh, endorsed it in two resolutions, both of which were vetoed by the United States. Bush won. <sighs> well, uh, for, we can begin with the invasion of Panama. Uh, the invasion of Panama, which according to the Panamanians, killed about 3,000 people since it's never investigated. We don't know if that's true or not. Uh, this was done in order to uh, kidnap a uh, disobedient thug who had been supported by the United States right through his worst atrocities. Noriega. Noriega, who was brought to Florida and tried for crimes that he committed mostly on the CIA payroll. Okay, that's aggression. Uh, we could go into the details of the war in Iraq, uh, but uh, there were plainly opportunities for, they might not have worked, we don't know, but there were opportunities for diplomatic settlement which the Bush administration refused to consider, and incidentally the press would not report with a single exception, and Long Island Newsday, which did report the whole story throughout accurately, and is the only newspaper in the country to have done so. Uh, the uh, uh, Bush administration then did attack, and uh, the attack was uh, carried out in, uh, in a manner which is criminal under the laws of war. Um, they attacked uh, uh, infrastructure, and if you attack New York City, and you destroy the electrical system, the power system, the sewage systems, and so on, that amounts to biological warfare. And that's the nature of the attack. Uh, then came a sanctions regime, which uh, it's mostly Clinton, but began with Bush, which is, by conservative estimates, killed hundreds of thousands of people while strengthening Saddam Hussein. That takes us off to Clinton, which that's the beginning, but that's by no means the end. We can run through it. Well, we can run through it. That one case suffices. All right. But there are plenty of others. Bush too. Well, let's take. Let's go on with Clinton. Okay. And one of Clinton's minor esca minor escapades, very minor, was sending a couple of cruise missiles uh, to the Sudan to destroy what they knew to be a pharmaceutical plant. There was no intelligence failure. According to the only estimates we have from the German ambassador and the uh, uh, director, regional director of Near East Foundation, who does field work in uh, Sudan, both of them estimate several tens of thousands of deaths from one cruise missile attack. It's pretty serious. If somebody uh, did that to us, we'd regard it as bad news. And again, we can continue. Uh, during In the Middle East, for example, the uh, uh, Clinton began by declaring past UN resolutions, uh, in the words of his administration, uh, obsolete and anachronistic. Okay, so we're finished with that. No more international law. Uh, then comes a, uh, a period called the peace process, except that during the peace process, uh, Israeli, uh, US, uh, Israeli settlement, which means settlement paid for by the U.S. taxpayer and supported by U.S. military aid and diplomacy, continually increased. Uh, the, the most extreme year was Clinton's last year, the highest level of settlement, the highest since 1992. Uh, meanwhile, the territories were cantonized, broken up into small regions with uh, infrastructure projects and new settlement. Uh, I don't know what you call that, but it's under military occupation. And if anyone else was doing it, we'd call it a war crime. And again, we can continue. I wish to, I don't think we have to discuss. I don't think the way to deal with neo-fascist groups is to try to shut them up forcefully. You should try to win the argument. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable to see how it works. So it takes a Holocaust denial. Uh, in a lot of Europe, uh, the Holocaust denial is a crime. In France, it's a, uh, there are laws against it. You can't do it. Uh, in the United States, it's not a crime. Uh, the, the consequence is that in the United States, Holocaust denial is unknown. There's plenty of it. You know, there's professors, at, uh, tenured professors at universities who have published books uh, denying the Holocaust. Nobody pays any attention to them. And it's ridiculous. I forget about it. It's just crazy business. In France and a lot of Europe, it's all over the front pages. A uh, ton of publicity. You know, some guy somewhere does some marginal thing. Uh, everybody knows about it. It's, it's a way of giving publicity to Holocaust denial. Uh, if you treat it the sensible way, it's, it's not like somebody claiming the earth is flat. Okay, forget it. It has no, no impact. Uh, I, I just don't think it's even tactically the right way to deal with, uh, uh, say, neo-fascist groups. And it does give them an argument. As you said, they can claim freedom of speech, which is a value we ought to uphold. We should recognize what I think is true. I've written about it plenty myself, that the Bolshevik revolution, the so-called revolution, it was really a coup, was really a counter-revolution, which... Uh, uh, placed state power in the hands of a highly authoritarian anti-socialist group, which within a couple of months had destroyed the factory councils, had destroyed the Soviets, had dismissed the constituent assembly because they knew they were going to lose, uh, and had eliminated every popular movement, and had done exactly what Trotsky said, turned the country into a labor army under the control of the maximal leader. That was mid-1918. I mean, since then, there hasn't been a shred of socialism in the Soviet Union. Now, of course, they called it socialism, but they also called it democracy. You know, they were people's democracies, the purest form of democracy. They were socialism. The, left, the West, the big propaganda system in the world, of course, just laughed at the democracy part, but it loved the socialism part because that's a way to defame socialism. So if you think that the fall of the Soviet Union uh, is a blow to socialism, you ought to also think on the same grounds that it's a blow to democracy. 
After all, they call themselves democracies too, so why isn't it a bloated democracy? It makes as much sense. It's only when it gets filtered through the Western propaganda system that it's not a bloated democracy, but it is a bloated socialism. But you know, there's absolutely no reason to play that game, whether you play it in dissent or in the nation or on the right or anywhere else. Expose it for the fraud that it is. What ideology? The ideology of totalitarianism? Yeah, it's deeply flawed. I mean, they were the initial modern totalitarians. It's not as nothing to do with socialism. They destroyed socialism within weeks. You know, they didn't wait. By 1918, it was finished. And they knew it. You know, like it's not a secret. They knew it. I mean, in fact, Lenin, as soon as, you know, as soon as he sort of got grips of things after he said, let's be, he moved to what he called state capitalism, which is what it was. It had nothing to do with socialism. Socialism, I mean, you can argue about it. There's no point arguing what the word means. But what it always meant at the core was that uh, producers take control of production. You know, working people take control of production, what's sometimes called industrial democracy. That was the absolute core of it. Well, you know, there was more socialism in Germany, in Western Europe, than there was in Russia. You know, Russia is about the most anti-socialist place you can imagine since 1918. Had wage labor, had super exploitation. Uh, had no element of workers' control or involvement or participation. It's pure, you know, what's it got to do with socialism? It's the exact opposite on every point. As I say, the West liked to call that socialism while laughing at the fact that they call themselves Democrats. But that's for purely propaganda reasons. I mean, unless you're committed to being part of the Western propaganda system, there's nothing to say about that issue of dissent except to laugh. Now, in one of our previous conversations, you mentioned that theory is not really of an interest to you, nor do you think that it's useful at times for practical application in attempting to combat and change these systems of power. Uh, however, one of the more wide-ranging left intellectuals of our time, uh, Slavoj Žižek, takes almost the exact opposite approach to his work. He draws on the work of Derrida, Lacan, and various others to illuminate his critique of global capitalism, empire ideology, and so forth. Can you talk about why you personally haven't written more books on, say, political or economic or social theory? And then what are your thoughts on Slavoj Žižek's work? Uh, as, as with regards to how much of it you're aware of or have read or, or engaged yeah. with. And then his use of French psychoanalyst Lacan's work. And then, of course, any words on Derrida's work, uh, deconstructionism and that legacy. Well, that's what you're referring to is what's called theory. And the reason when I said I'm not interested in theory, what I meant is I'm not interested in posturing. Uh, using fancy terms like uh, pen polysyllables and uh, pretending that theory when you have no theory whatsoever. So there's no theory in any of this stuff, not in the sense of theory that uh, anyone's familiar with in the, in the sciences or in any other serious field. Uh, try to find in all of the work you mentioned some principles uh, from which you can deduce conclusions uh, that yield the uh, empirically testable propositions uh, where it all goes beyond the level of uh, you know, something you can explain in five minutes to a 12-year-old. See if you can find that. When, when the fancy words are decoded, I can. So I'm not interested in that kind of posturing. This is just an extreme example of it. I don't, I don't see anything in what he's saying. Uh, Jacques Lacan actually knew. Uh, I'm kind of like that we have meetings every once in a while, but I thought, frankly, personal, quite frankly, I thought it was a total show. Mm -hmm. Just posturing for the uh, television cameras and the way many powers intellectuals do. But why this is influential, I have the slightest idea. I don't see anything there that should be uh, that, that should be influential. So maybe you can tell me why you think it's in, there's something significant. I don't see it. So yeah, I'm not interested in that kind of uh, theoretical posturing, which has no content. And would you, I mean, I think it would be interesting for a lot of folks, particularly because this work has become more and more popular. I remember just hearing Zizek's name a few years ago. And then now when I go into different organizing circles or if I go to different events or protests or rallies or so forth, assemblies, um, I hear his name and his work being brought up often. It seems you just recently had a conversation with Angela Davis, Vijay Prashad, of course, moderated the conversation in Boston. And I would like to see more of those conversations take place, even from, say, folks coming from different angles, people such as yourself and, say, someone as Slavoj Zizek, who, whose work is becoming more influential. Are those things that, do you think that's helpful to have have those maybe not even debates but at least conversations with people on the left who are providing work for people who do find it influential i mean do you think this is something we should think about well you say his work is becoming influential i wouldn't question that i think his posture is becoming influential can you tell me what the work is i can't find it i mean i see a lot of uh, you know uh, kind of a he's good you know he's a good actor he uh, makes things sound exciting uh, but can you find any content i, I can't so I, I would have no interest in that having a conversation with him, and I suppose it's, uh, uh, the converse is true as well, I imagine. But the discussion with Angela Davis is fine. She's an interesting person. Thinks about things, has important things to say. It's not an interesting thing. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit like the uh, huge energy that's put out on trying to figure out who killed John F. Kennedy. Uh, yeah. Who knows? And who cares? I mean, 
plenty of people get killed all the time. Why does it matter that one of them happened to be John F. Kennedy? Uh, if there was some reason to believe that there was a high-level conspiracy, it might be interesting. Uh, but the evidence against that is it's overwhelming. Uh, and after that, it's just a matter you know, if it happened to be a jealous husband or the mafia or someone else, uh, what difference does it make? It's just taking energy away from serious issues like the ones that don't matter. Uh, and I think the same is true here. It's not personal talking about, and that's only a small part of the system. Uh, things have to be done for the rest of the population, too. They have to be marginalized, but they're not going to be marginalized by uh, telling them uh, lies about foreign policy, because just as you say, they don't believe most of what they read. There's just a kind of a general populist skepticism, along with this sense that the government is run by a few big interests looking out for themselves, is the sense that the media are probably lying to us. Uh, so for most of the population, the media system is, I think, a different one. It's not just the case that it tries to entertain them. It tries to entertain them through means which will intensify attitudes that support the interests of elites. So you want, for example, let me give some cases. Uh, take the emphasis on professional sports. Now, uh, the, it sounds harmless, but it really isn't. Professional sports are a way of building up jingoist fanaticism. Uh, you're supposed to cheer for your own team. I, just to mention something from personal experience, I remember very well myself when I was, I guess, a high school student, sudden revelation, you know, when I asked myself, why am I cheering for my high school football team? <laughs> I don't know anybody on it. If I met anybody on it, I'd probably hate each other. You know, why do I care whether they win or if some guy a couple blocks away wins? Well, you know, uh, and then you can say the same thing about, you know, the baseball team or whatever else it is. Uh, this idea of cheering for your home team, which you mentioned before, that's a way of building into people irrational uh, submissiveness to power. You know? And it's a very dangerous thing. And I think it's one of the reasons it's such a big, it's, it's, it gets such a huge play. Now there are other media too, whose basic social role is quite different. It's diversion. There's the, the real mass media the kinds that are aimed at, you know, the guys who, Joe Sixpack, that kind. The purpose of those media is just to dull people's brains. This is an oversimplification, but for the 80% or whatever they are, the main thing for them is to divert them, to get them to watch National Football League and to worry about, uh, you know, mother with child with six heads or whatever you pick up in the, uh, you know, in the thing that you pick up on the supermarket stands and so on. Uh, or, you know, look at astrology or get involved in, you know, fundamentalist uh, stuff or something. Or just get them away, you know. Get them away from things that matter. Uh, and for that, it's important to uh, reduce their capacity to think. The sports section is handled in another special department. The sports reporter must be a specialist in his knowledge of sports. He gets his story right at the sporting event and often sends it into his paper play by play. Take say sports. That's another crucial example of the indoctrination system, in my view. Uh, for one thing, because it, you know, it, it offers people something to pay attention to uh, that's of no importance. That keeps them from worrying about. You know, keeps them keeps them from worrying about things that matter to their lives that they might have some idea about doing something about. And in fact, it's striking to see the intelligence that's, that's used by ordinary people in sports. I mean, you listen to radio stations where people call in. They have the most exotic information and uh, understanding about, you know, all kind of arcane issues. And the press undoubtedly does a lot with this. I remember in high school already, I was pretty old, I suddenly asked myself at one point, why do I care if my high school team wins the football game? I mean, I don't know anybody on the team, you know. I, I, I mean, they have nothing to do with me. I mean, why am I cheering for my team? It doesn't mean it make any sense, you know. Uh, and, but the point is, it does make sense. It's a way of building up irrational attitudes of submission to authority and, you know, group cohesion behind, uh, you know, leadership elements. In fact, it's training in irrational jingoism. That's also a feature of uh, competitive sports. I think if you look closely at these things, I think they have, typically they do have functions. And that's why energy is devoted to supporting them and creating a basis for them and advertisers are willing to pay for them and so on.